What was before the Big Bang? What caused the Big Bang? Well, in this video, we'll dive deeper into the answer. So in order to really understand what happened before the Big Bang, we have to really understand what the Big Bang was. The Big Bang was not an explosion. The Big Bang is a moment in time when the universe, as we know it, is smaller, hotter, and denser. All the galaxies, the entire universe we know today, all the space and time was condensed into this marble-sized volume. So the Big Bang happened everywhere. The Big Bang happened where you're standing. And there was no one point within the universe where the Big Bang happened. There's no one area where it happened. All points in the universe are expanding away from each other. And if we look out into the universe, we see galaxies all around us. We see galaxies on this side, on that side, on that side, 360 degrees around us. We see galaxies and stars and dust all around us and all surrounding us. The diameter of the entire observable universe is about 93 billion light years. And just 100 years ago, we discovered that the universe is expanding. It's getting larger. If we were to take all of the galaxies and everything we see and contract it, in other words, go back in time, we can see that the entire universe was once a smaller, hotter, denser place. And we can do physics to understand what happened at that state, at the Big Bang itself, the rapid inflation event. And we can also observe the Big Bang today with the CMB radiation. We have WMAP data and we also have Planck data that was taken more recently in about 2009. And what we see when we look out in the universe is the radiation in a microwave form from the Big Bang, the very first light of the universe that was able to escape. So the light we see in the CMB radiation, the microwave radiation is literally all around us. In fact, some of it's going through your house to right now. It's all around us and this radiation is what we observe with the CMB. So when we see the W map or the Planck map, what we're observing is that light from the Big Bang. We're looking at baby pictures of the universe. What we find in these pictures is that they're very homogenous. The universe seems very uniform. In terms of energy contributions in the universe, they seem very, very uniform. Of course, there's some little ripples there. You can hear in there, you can see some ripples. In fact, that's actually explained by inflationary cosmology, which we'll go into next. But I just want to give you an understanding what the Big Bang was and why it's important to know what the Big Bang is before we talk about what happened before it. Because it all depends on what you mean by a before. Before is a relative term. Beginnings and befores, these are all relative. As we know, time is relative. Like I mentioned before, the universe being uniform was a problem for scientists. They just didn't understand why it was so uniform. They couldn't really explain it. But if parts of the universe only operate within the realms of the speed of light, how can it be that it was so uniform? It seems like there was some communication between the different regions of the universe on the opposite sides, but obviously there can't be that communication. It must be there's something special about the early universe that made it so uniform. We also know that the universe appears to be completely flat. The universe, well, at least four dimensionally speaking, seems to be completely flat. If I take a sheet of paper, I know that paper is flat because I can draw a triangle on it and the size of the triangle all add up to 180 degrees. That's a perfect triangle because it's a perfect flat area. But when it comes to a sphere, if I were to draw a triangle on a sphere, the sides will all end up to being larger than 180 degrees, hinting to a curved, a positively curved surface like a sphere would yield. And if there was a negative curvature of the universe, if the universe was curved in this way like a potato chip, we would observe something like the angles being smaller than 180 degrees all combined in the triangle that we produce. So we can kind of using trigonometry, take a look at the density regions of the universe and kind of draw our own universal triangle. And we discovered that the universe appears to be completely flat. There seems to be no curvature. The angle is so particular that it matches with what a flat universe would be. So the question is why? How is the universe flat if it's expanding? So these questions have been puzzling scientists for the last 100 years, but about 45 years ago, Alan Guth comes out with this inflationary cosmology model of the universe, where he predicts inflation. And inflation has a way of actually elegantly solving these problems that scientists have been trying to solve using the standard model. Now, inflation requires a deep understanding of quantum mechanics, okay? At the Big Bang, general relativity, our physical calculations in general relativity, they break down. 
they break down absolutely. We have no idea. We can't solve for what happens beyond the Planck length. The lengths are too small for us to kind of understand using general relativity. We need quantum mechanics to go deeper, to go smaller, to understand what really happens there. The crazy thing about quantum mechanics is that it works on uncertainty and probability. And it doesn't work the way we typically think in the macro world. Now, in the very micro small world, we find that empty space. If I take out the particles in empty space, if I take out radiation, if I take out everything from empty space and I'm left with space, it turns out that we can actually measure the quantum activity happening inside of pure empty space. This is called vacuum energy. And it turns out that all regions of the universe, all regions of space-time has this vacuum energy. So we can imagine this empty space where there are certain fluctuations in these energy fields. Imagine these quantum fields being these mathematical descriptions of a space-time or volume that has these excitations of, of energy states. And we can probabilistically measure, you know, how likely it is for some fluctuations to occur and how uh, others are not. So the point is that we can describe this as a potential energy function. In inflationary cosmology, we call these kind of fields scalar fields, where when we assign numbers to energy states, there's no direction as to where it's going. It's just kind of random, kind of like assigning temperatures to specific molecules in a room, right? Every, every molecule has a specific state of energy or movement, and there's no area where there's more heat or less heat. It's just kind of homogenized there. It's not like any other field, like a magnetic field, where there are certain vectors that correlate to the certain magnitudes of, of magnetism there. It's more like a volume with random energy states. How it relates to the universe, the Big Bang, is a particular scalar field called an inflaton field. Now, remember, these fields undergo something called self-interaction, where the virtual particles that are produced kind of tug at the field, and the field tugs back at it, and this potential energy is stored in this inflaton field. So imagine this inflaton field having lots of energy stored within it. Now, if we were to graph this inflaton field in terms of its energy potential, we could describe it as having a potential energy function, energy versus fuel strength. So within the potential energy function, there are hills and valleys in which some states are lower energy, some states are higher energy, and certain spikes can yield certain virtual particles, etc. Now it turns out that in the symphoton field, there are certain points where it likes to stay. There are certain points called its lowest energy state or the vacuum state. And this is where it likes to be. But also there are plateaus on this graph and that would be called a false vacuum state. So there's a false vacuum state where it's typically pinned in like a higher energy density. Then there's a lower energy state where its energy levels are at its lowest. Now, going from this false vacuum state to this lowest energy state, it doesn't just happen immediately. Although it wants to get there, it takes time to get there. Now, certain inflaton fields have certain states where it will go from high energy density to a vacuum state, but in a very, very slow way. It will it'll slowly roll down to its true vacuum state. As it happens, the state of the inflaton field expands. It cools down. But then when it gets to a certain state near its vacuum state, it rapidly gets there. That's what inflation is. Inflation is that negative pressure associated with that false vacuum state becoming a lower state. And in that process, negative pressure builds up and it inflates. The universe rapidly inflates, especially when it gets down to its lowest energy state. The universe inflates rapidly. And during that process, what remains are, there are those inflaton particles. As those inflaton particles are being produced, the, the inflaton field reheats again because that energy in form of particles is being dispersed out into the, into the inflaton field. And then those particles, as they decay over time, they turn into quarks and gluons and electrons, the, the baryonic matter that we're used to, the stuff we're made of. The energy never goes away. It's always there. We, so we're left with this super hot, dense state, this quark-gluon plasma of particles that then, as the universe is in its lowest energy state, inflation stops. So we have a rapid inflation. Quark-gluon plasma is produced. Inflation slows down. So you can see that the universe was rapidly inflating immense amounts of inflation in like a fraction of a fraction of a second, right? We're talking picoseconds. After that phase transition, the universe slowly stopped expanding. As all that matter and energy put a pressure on the universe to contract, it kept expanding, but much more slower. And it went on that way for about 10 billion years until about 5 billion years ago, 
where the universe began to expand again, that negative pressure, that vacuum energy was still present. It didn't go away. It was still there in the universe. As the universe expanded enough, that negative energy was able to now take over again. And then inflation continued to happen. And, and that's what we're seeing in the universe. We're seeing a, a, an acceleration of this expansion because um, there is enough negative pressure now able to do its work. So the universe we know and love today really came from a smaller realm, but then inflated. It kind of magnified really rapidly. And the funny thing about this is that the problems we mentioned before, the problems of the flatness, the problems of the uniformity, those are solved by inflation. Because at the Big Bang itself, the universe was still very homogenous, very uniform, and then it magnified. And that uniformity continued as the, as the universe expanded. That uniformity was still there and still is present in the universe. That's why the universe is so homogenous, because it, all it did was magnify really rapidly. It also explains flatness, because it kind of like a, a balloon that's deflated. What do you notice? It's wrinkled, right? The balloon's surface is wrinkled when it's deflated. But then as you inflate the balloon, those wrinkles smooth out and they become a smooth surface. And um, now when it comes to the universe, again, this is not a completely analogous to a balloon, but the point is that the wrinkles flattened out as the universe expanded rapidly. And that's, what we, that's why we see a flat universe today because those curves and those wrinkles became flat as the universe expanded rapidly. And the reason why there are those small perturbations in the, in the CMB radiation is because during that false vacuum state slowly rolling into its true vacuum state, there were quantum fluctuations that were occurring during that time as it was still rolling down the hill, such that when it rapidly inflated, those fluctuations were still present as the universe inflated. And those, those fluctuations were magnified as well as the universe inflated. So that's why we see today all these clusters of galaxies and things like that, that was, those were seeded by those quantum fluctuations in the early universe. It's amazing to, to understand that that's where we come from. Now, again, we're not absolutely certain about this, but this is one of the most highly regarded models, inflationary models of the universe. Some of the brightest minds, Ed Witt and Alan Guth and Carol, all these amazing minds are actually working on this. And this is one of the best explanations of how the Big Bang happened. Now, you might be thinking, well, doesn't this mean that this, these kinds of um, inflationary events, these, these Big Bangs can happen many more times? Yes. We might be living in a pocket universe in a larger landscape of other, other Big Bangs occurring around us, other fluctuations occurring all around us. But the problem is that perhaps our pocket universe is expanding too fast to really see the remnants of other universes. Because you can imagine that these bubble universes are produced with this inflation, and sometimes they may collide with each other. But the problem is that our universe is expanding too fast for us to even see in the CMB radiation any hint or sign of these bubble collisions. So there might be other universes, other big bangs all around us happening, but the problem is we probably will never see them. But perhaps in the future, we might be able to infer that there's other pieces of data that might corroborate to bubble universes being there. And uh, that would be exciting to see. So the point is that this repulsive gravity material, this vacuum energy that is found in all of empty space, has the potential to produce universes. The most amazing part of this is that we really can get universes from what we would typically call nothing. You can have something from nothing in terms of Lawrence Krauss, his notion of nothing is that empty space that is full of quantum energy. But, but typically from our perspectives, we will call that empty space. There's nothing there, empty space, but it has the potential to produce an entire universe full of not just stars and galaxies, but living beings like us on this mere little planet able to even hypothesize about this. That's amazing to recognize. That's just remarkable. And something that I wish everybody could have the opportunity to learn. Every time we dive deeper into the universe, it defies our intuitions. It defies what we once thought was, was true or even possible. There's so much amazingness and richness and beauty in the universe. And the fact that it can come through probability that all this 
can just be products of pure randomness and chance something to be amazed and inspired by. Have a good day.